things you are about to see won't look familiar because they haven't happened yet. The supersonic jet will change everything you know about flying. You arrive at the jet port in a train that's almost as fast as some of the planes flying now. Robot porters clear your luggage for customs automatically. Please place your identity credit in the program slot. You don't have to carry a passport because a friendly computer already knows more about you than you do. To get to your jet, you travel through a pneumatic class two. Immediate boarding by auto walk. You there's no waiting in this supersonic age, and very little walking. This is your purser speaking. We recommend setting your mood controls at 19 for takeoff. Supersonic is equipped with all the modern conveniences. An electronic ballet to clean and press your clothing. A video phone to keep you in touch with home. Almost to Lima. There's even something new for a headache. And when you're hungry, you don't have to push a hostess around. Just a button. You can watch one of three different movies, or all three at one time. Looking farther into the future, someday we may watch TV on large flat panels. It's a long way from this experiment to commercial use in people's homes. But there is the promise of a very large image on a panel no thicker than a framed painting, and perhaps of more immediate interest is the video disc. Here, the technology is quite well developed, both for mechanical systems and for optical systems using a laser beam like this one. This approach makes possible a long playing, non-contact, non-wearing system. Such a player offers capabilities such as stereo sound, freezing any desired frame, and quick scanning through the program material on the disk. What the market for such a system will be like, and what final form the system will eventually take. Uh, these are complex questions. But there is one thing we do know. In research, we have to keep looking to the future, because that is how we got to where we are today. Welcome to Imperial Point in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Here the Hap Gaines Construction Company combines formal garden beauty with gold medallion standards to create luxury living for 1,500 families. Imperial Point homeowners discover the pleasure of luxury living begins on the drawing board, where free architectural service gives each family the opportunity to express individual taste and to include their own ideas in the home of their choice. Tasteful decor and the finest appointments, including General Electric appliances and climate control, help provide the ultimate in comfort and convenience for every homeowner. In many of these custom homes, kitchen service bars and spacious filtered pools offer a new dimension in patio living. Protected by sliding glass doors and attractive fiberglass ceilings, Indoor swimming becomes a pleasure morning, noon, and night year-round. And entertaining is a pleasure in all seasons, thanks to General Electric's Weathertron Central Cooling Systems. Imperial Point, formal garden beauty and all-electric living for luxury living in Fort Lauderdale, Florida.
pilots of the future will not be able to get their favorite ball game on this TV monitor, but they will get a clear view of their own landing approach, even though their ship's nose might block a direct view from the cockpit. As a result of a recent NASA Ames Research Center project, which investigated landing instruments, closed circuit TV may be used as an aerial aid to safer touchdowns on earthbound airstrips and lunar landings. This experimental system consists of two general electric closed circuit television cameras, one TV monitor, and a mirror. One camera mounted on the plane's nose, and another beneath the fuselage, transmit pictures to a TV monitor mounted behind the pilot's cockpit. With the aid of a mirror, which reflects the TV image in proper relation, the pilot can view his landing approach from the camera's eye and make instant adjustments to assure safe touchdowns. Closed circuit television for safe aircraft and space vehicle landings. Another example of how NASA and General Electric are planning today for safe landings in the aerospace world of tomorrow. The largest all-nuclear power station now operating in the United States recently was shut down on schedule but only to replenish fuel after more than a year of remarkably high nuclear reactor availability. General Electric at San Jose, California, manufactured uranium dioxide pellets, which provide heat to produce steam in the reactor. The pellets were assembled to form fuel rods, then put together as fuel assemblies, and then they were shipped to the Dresden station southwest of Chicago. Commonwealth Edison operators working over a blanket of water loaded them into baskets for transfer to the reactor loading canal and fuel sump. Finally, they replaced fuel assemblies in the reactor. Only 96 assemblies, one-fifth of the total fuel load, were replaced. The total load of 56 tons of uranium will provide heat equivalent to 50,000 tons of coal per month for the next nine months. When the head of the reactor vessel was replaced, the station started up again. Today, Dresden produces enough electric power for a community of 200,000 people. To date, it has produced more than three and a half billion kilowatt hours of electricity. And during the last 13 months, the nuclear reactor was available to help produce power a remarkable 99.2% of the time. One of the world's most reliable power stations, Dresden shows the way to better and more economical generation of electric power. You're watching Sleep Core, Pleasant Dreams. General Motors Parade of Progress, traveling the high roads and by roads of America, bringing to millions of Americans in their own hometown the fascinating story behind modern industry, showing actual performances of many of the amazing processes of research that lead to a new and better mode of living for all of us. The Parade of Progress was suggested by Charles Franklin Kettering, research chief for General Motors. Mr. Kettering believes that if some of the basic principles and achievements of research in science were popularized and brought to us in a more understandable form, we could get a better conception of the secret of America's industrial leadership and the promise it holds for the future. The caravan beneath all its circus trappings carries an important message to the people of America. Here is housed evidence the gigantic strides forward that have been made by industry. Here also, for comparison's sake, are survivals of the not too long ago that were hailed as the last word in progress. Here at the gasoline exhibit, the listeners are informed of an American achievement, tetraethyl lead. Today, providing America with a more efficient and economical fuel for motive power, on the farm, road, and in the air. An attempt is made to shatter a glass with nothing but sound waves. Sound waves which are moving up and out of the tube. With the glass placed between the ends of the tube, the young man proceeds to tune in on the natural frequency of the glass.
And that glass, ladies and gentlemen, was shattered by nothing but sound waves. And so, the parade of progress comes to an end. Soon the huge silver tent will be folded away, and the great future liners will roll off to their next destination, on across America, ever telling the fascinating story behind modern American science and industry and what it means to all of us. for this Chevrolet Nova, a highly prized example of Japanese design and American workmanship from the late 20th century. One Now, come on, ladies and gentlemen, nothing about 170, one of the best-built automobiles of its time. Four, eight, one, 90, 200. Yours, sir, for $200,000, the gentleman on screen, 17. Chevy Nova, no wonder they gave it a six-year, 60,000-mile limited warranty. John, you're looking well this morning. I'm very pleased and proud, uh, John, uh, to participate with you this morning in this historic call. And uh, the city of Pittsburgh has been a, a pioneer, as you know, somewhat in the communications field, having had the first commercial radio station here. And I'm so pleased to be part of this new dimension of communication. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. I'm delighted, too. You know, I'm really pleased to be part of this first this picture phone is just as much a uh, an amazing uh, innovation today as the telephone was when your father participated in the first call back there in Tennessee. By the way, I want to congratulate you on your recent election as board chairman, and I'd also like to congratulate you as being one of the first com customers here to the picture phone. Thank you very much. Now, we've had a uh, we've had a great interest in this picture phone development because you think that more and more of our problems are due to uh, a lack of good communication. Incidentally, I understand you've become somewhat of an expert on the picture phone and have some uh, uh, methods that you'd like to demonstrate. Could you do anything for us, John? Well, yes, but, uh, we have uh, we have a very nice control system on this. Uh, just for example, we can uh, change the, uh, the uh, size of the picture like this, or, or, or with, with the zoom control. Uh, we can move it uh, up and down with a uh, with a height control. Uh, we have a way of cutting off the voice. For example, I'll start counting and I'll cut off the voice and then put it back on. One, two, six, seven, eight, nine. So that. In case we uh, we want to uh, to cut off the uh, the voice from here, we can do that. Uh, we have a uh, a uh, privacy control which cuts out the picture, and I'll push that, and all you'll see is a band across the screen. I believe you see a band there now. Yes, so, I uh, these controls are are very good. There's a volume control to control the uh, voice. I think it's. Uh, They've done a very fine job of working out a control system. <coughs> there is another uh, uh, device I'd like to show you, and this is a way of showing of showing documents. And I'll, I'll show you uh, one of my favorite uh, documents on this, if I may. <laughs> <laughs> is that what they call a commercial, John? <laughs> <laughs> you might call that a commercial. I just happened to have that handy. <laughs> I, uh, I congratulate them on it. I think they've done a wonderful job, and I think that we're going to see uh, this picture phone system expanded about as rapidly as they're able to take care of it, because I think that it can be so helpful in our overall communication <coughs> program that, uh, that more and more people are going to find use for it, and I'm sure we're going to find it a very useful tool. You're watching Sleep Core. Media for Insomnia.
Stevie Wonder uses technology to create the sounds of the future. I'm Ray Kurzweil. I recently visited Stevie and a number of other innovators who live and work in the age of intelligent machines. Okay, here I am with my new synthesizer. And uh, this is great. All these different keys and all these buttons, etc. This is incredible. But uh, here I have this uh, visual display. Now, just imagine if you were not here. How will I know what it says? I'd be lost. But because of the technology, because of the interfacing of speech synthesizers with these instruments, I can push the button, know what it's saying by listening to it say. Hit record button to start and stop record. Sequencer activated. Record new sequence. Machines that talk to us. Machines that play music. Machines that capture the flexibility of human movement. Machines that learn. These are among the projects and new ideas on the frontiers of artificial intelligence. The science and the art of creating intelligent machines. capable of almost anything in principle and the reason for that is very simple machine at Yale University go. professor Roger Shank the thing that we want to do when we think about artificial intelligence is we want to think about how the daily processes of our lives actually are composed in terms of individual steps for example how do I go about composing the sentence I'm saying now how do you go about understanding it we don't really know offhand but what the science of artificial intelligence is about is trying to figure out each step Okay, let's put on the microphone. The real problem is not can machines think, but can people think well enough about how people think to be able to describe how they think to machines. Stefan Michalowski, a research scientist, helps Robert Yee, a quadriplegic, test a new artificial intelligence system. I just got involved in this project three days ago. I've been handicapped approximately two years. I fell down some stairs, concrete stairs, One, and injured my two, neck. Three, four. Let's try a few things. I've been working four, on this project to develop four, a robotic aid for disabled three, people for the last four years. Plus, Our final goal is to develop a practical plus, device that a disabled person plus, could use every day uh, in their everyday life to perform fairly simple manipulations in a home-like environment. Things like getting a drink of water or getting something to eat, opening the door, answering the phone, things like that. Okay, let's move the vehicle over to the left now. Left. This is the first time any handicapped person left. has ever worked on this Veterans Administration Research left. Project at Stanford University. It is a system in which a mobile robot is learning to obey spoken commands. Stop moving. At the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, Professor Marvin Minsky. Well, what's happened in research in artificial intelligence is, is rather surprising, I think. Uh, many of the problems that we thought would be very difficult 30 years ago turned out to be very simple. And many of the problems that we thought would be very simple came out to be very difficult. So this is, I think, one of the most difficult sciences that uh, people have ever attempted, the science of intelligent processes, the science of complicated processes. Some of us tried to get machines to solve what we thought were very hard problems, do mathematics, play chess, solve puzzles. And it was quite easy uh, to get a machine to play a pretty good game of chess. It took only a couple of years. To get a machine to play 
master level chess took only another uh, 10 or 20 years. Uh, no machine has been world champion of chess, but there's a machine that was world champion of backgammon, if anyone cares, and uh, those things weren't so hard to do. So many of the things that people respect highly turned out to be easy. And yet, simple things, the kind of thing that a child does uh, when it ties its shoelaces, that's far beyond anything we can do now. Not just making mechanical hands that could handle the strings, but understanding how loops and knots work and understanding how the loops contain each other and what holds a knot together is a very complicated problem. I don't say that a child understands that explicitly, but it has some idea about it. A very young child can distinguish between house pets. It knows the difference between a cat and a dog. But this is something an intelligent machine still cannot do. Teaching a machine to recognize different images depends upon a computer science technique called pattern recognition. Machines have been taught to recognize the unique characteristics of each letter. In the capital letter A, for example, the angle at the top, the enclosed space, the crossbar, and the concave region at the bottom are four such features. Machines can now read the alphabet as readily as any person. Building on this ability to recognize letters, reading machines for the blind can now read those letters aloud as words, sentences, books. Now with technology, I can do things that uh, I've always wanted to do immediately, like reading this book. This book is called Blues from the Delta. I can just simply take it, turn this machine, turn the machine on. Scanner moving to the top of page. Looking for the first line. And no matter how versatile, the solo performer could never match the sound of blues bands which featured several guitars, a harmonic and drums together. Everyone wants to feel as if they can be as independent as possible. Everyone really wants to have the freedom of doing, reading, discovering things on their own. The latest blues sound. To expand their repertoire. Technology for me is, has been like a, a brother, a mother, a friend. It has been that very thing that uh, I have not been able to do, but has helped me to do it, and that is to see. Without question, it has been another, another one of those sunshines of my life. You're watching Sleepcore. Sleep tight. We think we've equipped ordinary citizens with some of the most sophisticated tools that a video artist could hope to put their hands on now. So that ordinary people actually get to control television. You can be artist and scientist and climb inside the medium. So this is more than just play, in your opinion. We want to expose people to an interactive environmental television experience. And we're getting a picture on the TV. Edit. And that's where the artist, as the antenna of the society, as Mal Rowe put it, started to point the way uh, towards that kind of eventuality. The final result of this revolution may be more control over your TV set. When you watch TV, you'll have more to choose from, and you may even end up making what you watch. I am Simon Borgen. We are with Dr. Isaac Asimov, a biochemist who may be the most widely read of all science fiction writers. He has written 155 books and hundreds of magazine articles and short stories. Dr. Asimov's books are translated wherever books are published, and there is no such thing as an Asimov book that doesn't sell. There is also no such thing as a dull Asimov book and it, it would be hard to find a writer with wider interests. His work includes science fiction, Greek and Roman history, mystery novels, fiction and nonfiction for teenagers, and a whole corpus of books interpreting science and technology for the layman. 
Dr. Asimov has co-authored a medical textbook, and there is Asimov's Guide to Shakespeare and Asimov's Guide to the Bible, as well as a history of the United States. As a professional biochemist, Dr. Asimov is unique among science fiction writers, but it might be more accurate simply to say that Dr. Asimov is unique. He was born in Russia, near Smolensk, and brought to New York at the age of three. He was nine, working in his father's candy store in Brooklyn, when he sneaked a copy of Amazing Stories from the magazine stand and confronted spaceships for the first time. He had already scribbled his first novel, The Greenville Chums at College, into a five-cent copy book. A brilliant student and possessed of a phenomenal memory, Asimov entered Columbia University at 15. He sold his first science fiction story at 18. By the time he had worked as a Navy chemist during World War II and returned to Columbia to get his doctorate, he was earning his living by writing science fiction. He sold his first book in 1949, just as he joined Boston University Medical School to teach biochemistry. After 10 years of teaching, Dr. Asimov found that it was confining to be able to write only on weekends, and he quit teaching so that he could devote full time to writing. Dr. Asimov's readers will no doubt find it painful to think of how much they might have lost had Boston University continued to claim five-sevenths of Dr. Asimov in the past 15 years. At Dr. Asimov's current rate of writing, he will have produced 200 books by 1980. He isn't likely to tire or to slow down. Dr. Asimov's idea of a vacation is being left alone at his typewriter. Dr. Asimov. At a time when science and technology are producing the almost incredible every day, how does a science fiction writer stay ahead of things? Well, he doesn't really have to. Uh, I mean, everything that science does gives him new plots. Right now, for instance, a science fiction writer can write perfectly amazing stories concerning black holes. Five years ago, the science fiction writer never heard of black holes. And yet, uh, many people who, who look back to what was predicted by science fiction writers in the 1930s, simply because these things have arrived, they believe that, that science fiction writers are out of anything to write. Uh, well, you're right. You see, people think that what we used to write about is what we have to keep on writing about. Not at all. What we wrote about in the old days is now passe. We'll write about new things. I, I think you said somewhere along the way that uh, Whereas you used to write about these things in Amazing Stories, now you write about them in the New York Times. You're right, about uh, colonies on the moon, for instance, about robots. Well, back in 1939, you published a story that dealt with the first flight around the moon and back. Frank Borman and his Apollo 8 crew actually carried this mission out in 1968. You placed the story in 1974. How does a science fiction writer feel when something like that happens? Well, it makes him feel very good. I'm a little annoyed with myself because I was so conservative. You see, I'm six years behind, and also I, I didn't allow for all the various things we did before then, men in flight, men docking, mid-course corrections. I just had someone get into a ship and go around, one man. And uh, it makes me feel as though I wish I could do it more often. But as a matter of fact, if you go through all my books, you'll find that the number of things I've spoken about that have really come true are very small. That probably goes for other science fiction writers as well. Oh yes, when people talk about how science fiction writers predict the present, it's because they've gone through a large corpus of work and picked out certain things. Uh, we can't just predict. There isn't enough story material and straight prediction. We make up futures. It doesn't matter whether we really think they'll come to pass or not. But we ask ourselves only, will this be interesting to deal with? Will this make a nice story? And then if some of them do come true, well, good. I think you wrote an essay called uh, Flight, uh, called Escape uh, from Fantasy to characterize what you thought the essence of science fiction was. Most people think it's a flight into fantasy. I think the title is Escape to Reality. Escape to Reality, I'm sorry. Right. Well, that's because, you see, when you think of the future, you try to make it as plausible as possible. 
Back in 1933, for instance, there were science fiction stories dealing with a world in which all the oil and coal had been burned up. Well, the youngsters who read that story in 1933, including myself, uh, took it seriously. At least I did. And I said, my goodness, what happens if we do burn up all the oil and coal? That's the first time that ever occurred to me that this might be a problem. Mm -hmm. So that on and off, I worried about using up our fossil fuel supplies for the last 40 years. And most of the world, virtually all the world, has only started worrying about it a few months ago, you know? I read a comment recently by a Russian scientist about an H.G. Wells story. It's called, When the Sleeper Wakes. The hero wake who has gone to, gone to sleep in London in 1900 wakes up 200 years later in 2100, and he finds that London's power is being supplied by huge wind-powered machines over London, and there are airplanes about the size of the first uh, DC, uh, DC-3s. And the, the scientist's comment was, the imagination of science fiction writers is certainly limited. Well, that's true. Uh, back in 1848, Edgar Allan Poe wrote a story set a thousand years in the future, in 2848. And in it, he had uh, transatlantic aeronautical voyages, only in balloons, going a hundred miles an hour. In other words, in his day, there were balloons. So his vision of the future was of faster balloons. If a New Guinea native thought of a future in which you could uh, communicate between continents, he'd think of very loud drums, you see. It's very difficult, really, to visualize the real future. Well, this raises the question of, of why science fiction writers are constantly going into outer space and to the moon and past them to the planets. Do they go there because that's where the future is going to be or was going to be? Uh, or, or do they go there because as a device of the novelist to set up a controlled environment? I suppose there's a little truth in both. Uh, the entire history of mankind has been that of crossing the hilltop to see what's in the next valley. Mankind has been exploring the earth over thousands of years. Somehow, just because we have now explored the entire Earth, even Antarctica and Greenland, it seems a shame to stultify this impulse of ours. And the next thing to explore is the moon and the planets. That's one thing. It's sort of an analogy from the past, an extrapolation forward. But then another thing, the m environments on these other planets are made to order for our purposes. Mm -hmm. Strange environments, the possibility of new forms of life, uh, this takes the place of stories in the old days about mysterious islands in the Pacific or hidden civilizations in uh, the Amazon Valley and so on. You couldn't produce that kind of heightened consciousness if you set your story in New York City, for instance. No, it gives us an interesting background. And then, of course, no matter how strange the background is, what goes on in the foreground should, if it's a good story, illuminate the human condition.